Hello, and welcome to How to Identify and Address Security Challenges in a Multi-Cloud Environment. Today's webinar is sponsored by Red Canary and produced by Actual Tech Media. My name is Scott Becker. I'm from Actual Tech, and I'm excited to be your moderator for this special event. Now, before we get to today's great content, we have four housekeeping items that will help you get the most out of this session. First off, we want this to be an informative event for you, so we encourage any questions in the questions box in your webinar control panel. So not only will we have team members looking over questions during the live event, but we'll also have a dedicated Q&A session at the end of the presentation where we'll discuss in greater detail some of the top questions that you ask. Now that Q&A panel is also the place to let us know about any technical issues that you might be experiencing. A browser refresh is gonna fix most audio, video, or slide advancement issues. But if that doesn't work, just let us know there in the Q&A and we'll provide further technical assistance. Now, second, in the handout section of your webinar control panel, you'll find that we're offering several resources. I'd especially like to call your attention to a bunch of great PDFs from Red Canary. So we've got a data sheet on Red Canary cloud protection, a guide on how to increase AWS visibility and improve cloud security, a data sheet on Red Canary MDR for AWS, and a data sheet on Red Canary MDR for Azure. So I encourage you to access those resources now and feel free to share them with your friends and your colleagues. Now, third, at the end of this webinar event, we will be awarding a $250 Amazon gift card to one lucky registrant. Of course, you must be in attendance during the live event to qualify for the prize. Official terms and conditions of today's prize drawing can also be found in your handout section. Just scroll to the bottom and you'll find the link with the details there. Now, finally, one of the best benefits of this event is the opportunity to ask a question of our expert presenter, who I'm going to introduce in a minute. So to help encourage your questions, we have a special additional prize for you. That's another Amazon gift card, this one for $50 for the best question. So after the event is over, we'll look at all the questions that came in and pick out the very best one and then contact that prize winner. All right. So with all that housekeeping out of the way, let's get to today's great session. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to our presenter today. We have Kevin G, who's a Senior Technical Product Marketing Manager at Red Canary. Kevin, welcome, great to have you here. Thank you, Scott, appreciate it. And thank you everybody for joining. All right, so, well, take it away. Awesome, awesome. So uh, yeah, let's dive right in. So today we're gonna be talking about kind of security challenges around multi-cloud environments. Um, we're going to kind of keep a high level. I'm not going to be diving deep into, you know, specific threats and stuff like that. The goal is to kind of lay out the foundation for what are some common challenges you might be facing within, you know, the cloud, and especially if you're using more than one cloud environment, um, and then to hopefully provide you with kind of some tools and frameworks uh, to take away and ways to think about how to kind of identify those gaps and identify those challenges within your own environment, um, and then you know, the kind of thought processes and things that you have to analyze to help address them. Um, so before we start, uh, just a little bit more about myself. Uh, so again, I'm, I'm the Senior Technical Product Marketing Manager here at Red Canary. I've been here for just under two and a half years. Uh, my primary focus is on our cloud MDR capabilities, all of our cloud integrations and stuff like that. Um, I also work a little bit on the like ROI and business valuation when you're thinking about an MDR compared to, you know, building a SOC internally or compared to, you know, other third party options, um, and then a bit of competitive Intel. Prior to Red Canary, I was uh, a technical marketing engineer at a cloud access security broker uh, for about five years. Um, so doing kind of a, you know, jack of all trades uh, type of stuff, a lot of internal enablement and demo management and uh, training and stuff like that. Um, and then a bit of personal information about me. I'm a huge golfer. Uh, you'll probably find me on a golf course if I'm not, you know, currently working. Uh, weather be damned, even if I'm up here in Portland, Oregon. Um, and I'm currently in the like mid single digit handicap range. Um, haven't entered a handicap uh, for a while just because of it's the off season and stuff like that. It's pretty wet out here. So, uh, all right, let's dive right into the webinar. So to kind of set the stage and kind of the reason why we're talking about this and why Red Canary is trying to talk about this a lot more. Uh, is that recently we kind of announced our whole multi-cloud launch. Uh, so what that really means is that we kind of recognize through, you know, talking to our customers, talking to prospects, and kind of seeing the way that the industry is moving, um, that more and more, you know, organizations are using, 
you know, various cloud service providers, maybe multiples of them, um, and that they're needing some sort of security guidance and security help um, and, you know, finding ways to operationalize the security tools that they're using to help protect those cloud environments. Um, and so we thought it was best to kind of bring our security expertise to the cloud. Uh, so what that looks like is we are integrating with kind of the big three vendors, right? AWS, Azure, and GCP. So we recently announced, you know, we already had AWS as part of our portfolio. We had Lacework previously within the past year as uh, within our portfolio. So part of our launch was announcing, you know, full integration with Azure and then with GCP uh, entering into early access. And, you know, we're going to be general availability within the next month or so. Uh, so stay tuned for that information. And then kind of similarly, we partnered with Wiz late last year um, and we're working on that integration uh, as we speak. And so that will be coming soon. Stay tuned for more details on, you know, a full integration with Wiz. Beyond that, you know, a lot of it is improving our threat intelligence and our threat profile and all of this sort of threat research and ancillary, you know, threat detection stuff that you get with partnering with Red Canary beyond just that sort of, you know, log monitoring and stuff, but all of the intelligence and everything that comes behind it. Um, and then we've also improved our Linux EDR capabilities um, and our Linux EDR tools by uh, helping to improve our metadata collection uh, to help identify kind of the origin points of threats within uh, some of your data planes, um, environments and stuff like that. Um, and then we recently announced our sort of co-managed Microsoft Sentinel uh, capabilities where we'll help you kind of get that onboarded and set up um, and stuff like that. So onwards to kind of some of the challenges and we're going to start with kind of a couple of stats that, uh, you know, when I read through industry reports and uh, surveys and stuff like that. So to kind of set the stage here, uh, the Cloud Security Alliance just, uh, you know, a month and a half ago in February released their 2024 state of security remediation. Um, and in that survey, they found that only 23% of respondents report having full visibility into their cloud, um, which is a pretty staggering number. It shows that, you know, a large high 70% of organizations out there feel like they're lacking some level of visibility, some level of control within their cloud environments. This data is oftentimes backed up. So whenever I look at these surveys and reports, all of these numbers kind of tend to be very similar and kind of pair or mirror each other. So last year in a Checkpoint 2023 cloud security report, they found that 76% of their respondents uh, were either concerned or extremely concerned about the security in their cloud environments. Um, I don't think any of this data is probably new to you on this call. Um, you know, you probably are experiencing the same sort of things or you are concerned that maybe there is some sort of gap in your security coverage and you're looking to figure out how to shore up those gaps. And then the final kind of sat point here, and it's not necessarily about the security itself, but just something that I found kind of eye popping is that 79% of respondents to the Thales cloud security survey were multi-cloud environments, um, which, you know, I didn't think that it was that, you know, prolific uh, across the industry that that many, um, you know, organizations are using more than one cloud service provider. Uh, but there it is. Um, so, you know, that could be due to various reasons. It could be for efficiency reasons, maybe cost benefits. Maybe it's, you know, cheaper to use AWS S3 and use Azure for virtual machines. And there's a cost element to that. Or maybe it's larger organizations, you know, merging or acquiring other companies and having to support different cloud environments, depending on, you know, if you are using something different than another company that you joined or merged with. Um, but, you know, it does show that there are more and more companies moving into multi-cloud environments, meaning you have to support more than just AWS or Azure or GCP. It often takes a combination of all of them. And that's kind of where we start with. One of the main difficulties is that it is very hard to be an expert in any one cloud service provider, right? When you think about, you know, even just AWS on its own and all of the capabilities and expansion uh, that you're able to do with how many resources you're able to spin up, all your S3 buckets, there's a lot of things to kind of pay attention to. But even internally, there's all of the different services and policies and controls that you also have to be aware of. And it's very difficult to be, you know, a 100% full on expert in one of those. And then that gets extrapolated when you are now using more than one environment. 
So just taking you know, AWS or any one of these, for example, the things that you are responsible for for protecting it is you have to have full visibility and observability over all of those resources. So those are kind of similar things, but two different things, right? You have to be visible and aware of what resources you have under there, right? How many you know, endpoints in the cloud you might have spun up, how many S3 buckets, what type of data you have there, how many users you have. You need to be aware of all of those individual things, what policies you've set up, what role accounts have access to certain things. But then you need the constant sort of monitoring, right? The 24-7 uh, observability to make sure like what changes are happening, what sort of threats might occur, what activity is occurring at any given time. Then you need to have the sort of expertise and knowledge to do that kind of ongoing detection and separate the sort of you know false positive normal activity from possible threat activity. And then you have to have the experience and you know security expertise to be able to mitigate and remediate those things. So from you know again a high level perspective, I know this is kind of small and blurry here. Uh, this is taken from AWS's website. It's also included in our AWS visibility guide. Uh, these are all just kind of a list of the services within AWS that you have to be aware of and kind of control, right? You have to know what they do and how to properly secure them or configure them or set them up to make sure that you're not accidentally exposing certain things, um, you know, to malicious actors or adversaries out there. The next sort of complication within the cloud, and again, this is kind of basic cloud 101 stuff, is that there are you know, two different aspects to the cloud, which is pretty unique when you think about securing your endpoints or your firewalls or, you know, a SaaS app and stuff like that uh, within the cloud, because this is a infrastructure as a service, there are, you know, the two components, your control plane and your data plane. Um, and you have to be very aware of everything going on within each of these. But it also means that a, you know, adversary gaining access to your control plane kind of gets keys to the entire kingdom. Right. They can now spin up new resources. They have access to the rest of your data plane resources that you've spun up. But you still have to pay attention to the data plane aspect because somebody can, you know, compromise your S3 buckets, steal all your data, break into one of your virtual machines, and then somehow find a way to escape back to host. So two very different sort of entities that you have to pay attention to in very different ways, but that are interconnected um, and can do, you know, quite a bit of damage to your organization. So jumping into the ways to protect these things, and obviously this is not, you know, complete or uh, and covers, you know, covers all of the different possible cloud security tools out there. Obviously, I'm leaving off, you know, SASEs and CASVs and stuff like that. Uh, but in general, when we're thinking about the control plane, kind of the main sort of ones that you sort of think of or that are, you know, sort of on the rise, you have your native security tools that are kind of built into AWS and Azure and GCP, right? AWS has Guard Duty. Azure, Microsoft has Microsoft Defender for Cloud. Um, Google has uh, their security uh, command center, um, stuff like that, where they do kind of, you know, scan your control plane. They'll kind of look at your data plane, kind of flag certain things that look suspicious, uh, but it's very limited, right? These are not necessarily security companies heavily focused on these security tools. Uh, not necessarily, um, and so there might be some sort of limited customizations, a lot of false positives, a um, lot of kind of limitations in how you can control those type of alerts and filters and stuff like that. Then when you think of the control plane, you have tools like Wiz and Lacework that are, you know, CNAPs and CSPMs where they're looking at the configuration of your environment uh, at rest, kind of trying to identify the risk and vulnerabilities and to surface any sort of, you know, accidental misconfigurations or even malicious misconfigurations that might indicate, hey, you are vulnerable here. Somebody might be able to exploit this. Your policies are too wide open. Somebody has a gap to get into your network. Um, and then obviously you have the data plane stuff, right? All of those endpoints in the cloud, uh, which you almost kind of treat as endpoints with EDR type tools where you can look at, you know, the runtime activity and the processes and the user activity within that data plane um, itself um, and kind of identify malicious activity that way. So a couple more stats on, on kind of cloud security as a whole. And so even when you recognize like 
where your challenges are, even if you've invested in a number of tools, whether you have Wiz as a CSPM, whether you have, you know, a SASE like Nescope or Cato or something like that, uh, you're using, you know, a number of different tools to secure your control planes and your data planes um, and all that stuff. What we've found, you know, again, just talking to our customers and prospects, but what I see across the board uh, within the industry from numerous surveys and research reports is that organizations find that they need help. And this is just kind of backing up some of those stats that we saw at the beginning where, you know, 77% of organizations say that they are concerned about their cloud security. They feel like they're lacking visibility in cloud security. This kind of backs up the why for that, right? Here again, the CSA report that came out last February uh, found that 61% of orgs say that they're using three to six different detection tools. So that adds another layer of complication. Not only do you need to be an expert within your cloud service provider that you're using or the multiples, but now you need to be an expert in all of these different tools. How do you set them up? What do the alerts mean when they're coming in? How do you react to that alert? How do you distinguish what is a real threat and what is a false positive? And then how do you use those tools to help you mitigate and remediate any possible you know, malicious activity that might be occurring? In an ESG ISSA report that came out last year, 71% of orgs responded that they are impacted by the cybersecurity skills shortage. Uh, so what that means is that oftentimes companies recognize that they might not have enough staff on hand or enough expertise behind their staff and need to hire more people, but it's very hard to find them. Um, you know, constantly reports show that there are more open positions within you know, the cybersecurity space then there are, are available talent, people to hire. Um, and so what often happens is people end up having to poach from other companies. Um, and then, you know, that means your company might end up dealing with churn down the line. Some other company is dealing with churn when somebody leaves for another job. People get burnt out from, you know, again, your lack of enough people and resources to maintain all of these tools and to secure your environment successfully. Um, and so it becomes, you know, a huge challenge. And then finally, this is all backed up by a SANS 2023 SOC survey that found that only 31% of organizations are able to kind of create and maintain their own 24-7 internal SOC team. So again, that leaves another 70% of organizations out there, again, kind of the mirroring uh, information here, that don't have enough resources or ability to hire enough people to monitor 24-7. And in today, obviously with cloud environments, especially, you do need to have that constant, you know, um, security, right? You need to have a security team constantly looking at your logs all day, all day, all night, all weekend, um, unfortunately, because attacks will happen uh, when you least expect them, especially when they know that people might be on, you know, holidays and weekends. Um, and then the last bit of information uh, from IBM's cost of a data breach last year, um, and this one is also kind of staggering and again, mirroring numbers here. 33% of the breaches that they studied were identified by that company's own internal team. So that means that, you know, the other almost 70% of breaches uh, that occurred that they studied were not identified by that team's, that organization. They were either revealed by, you know, the adversary down the line, hey, we got your data, we are trying to ransom it back to you, we're trying to exploit you they let them know because the company never found it out themselves or in a hopefully ideal situation, they were relying on a third party, you know, security vendor um, and they were the ones that could help them identify that. But it just kind of shows that, you know, organizations feel that there are gaps within the cloud, but they can't hire enough people to fill those gaps. So what, what can we do about this? What, how do you kind of recognize where your gaps are? Maybe you do feel like you have enough people, but there's something else missing. How do you identify those things? And really the solution is to use, you know, these sort of cybersecurity frameworks that are available to you, but really be kind of transparent and honest to yourself when you go through these assessments. Um, so one of the ones that we tend to use internally ourselves and that we're trying to model a lot of our talks after is the NIST cybersecurity framework. Um, so obviously here I'm not including governance, uh, but I do want to kind of lay out the sort of main areas where you need to focus your own organization for how you kind of secure your environments. Um, and the way that we think about it 
is we break them down. So the NIST cybersecurity framework domains are identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. We kind of break those down into the sort of like preparation phase, everything that you have to do within your organization pre-threat. The active threat, meaning, you know, an incident is ongoing, somebody is potentially attempting to get into your security environments and stuff like that. Uh, what are you doing when that happens? How do you identify that and respond to it? And then, you know, ideally a place that nobody ever wants to be in, which is the sort of post threat, a breach has already occurred and it's all about the recovery and stuff. So um, the best way that we kind of recommend talking about this is using a, you know, kind of like some sort of cybersecurity grid. We weren't the first to think of this, you know, shout out to the cyber defense matrix online, uh, but we are tweaking this a little bit. So ideally what I would recommend doing is setting up your domains at the top and they don't have to be this high level of just identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. Um, I know this is kind of small, but under each of those individual things is a whole bunch of different categories of information uh, that you need to be aware of, right? So under identify, there are things that you might have to do 100% internal, like identity management, asset management, access management, right? All of the sort of like perimeter things and kind of policy related things uh, within your organization. But also under identify is the entire world of like threat intelligence and research. You know, how are you doing malware analysis? How are you uh, developing adversary profiles and performing threat analytics and developing your own sort of analytics and detectors in order to prepare your team and your systems to be able to identify those threats? You know, there's the ongoing protection sort of thing, like what type of tools are you investing in? How do you perform threat simulation and ready your team? Um, and then eventually get to the det detection and monitoring part. So you could break those, break these domains at the top down um, as granular as you need. And then on the side, you have all of the domains that you need to protect, right? Your SaaS apps, IaaS, identity, email, endpoint, however you want to break this down. And then what I would recommend is instead of just turning this into a bingo card where you're just kind of checking boxes off, hey, we hired this person to do this thing, or we hired this person who's a cloud expert, IaaS is checked off 100%, or we invested in XYZ tool to do this thing, check it off, really evaluate how well those things are working within your environment. So when you think about it, you could do it on a scale of like one to five or one to 10, where one is, hey, we're very weak here, five or 10 is we're very strong. Or you could be kind of more, um, you know, uh, ones and zeros, kind of like a definitive yes, no type of thing where it's like, hey, negative one is this is negatively impacting us. We really need to address this. Zero could be like a neutral thing where you're saying, hey, we have coverage here, but we might need to revisit. One is, hey, we have excellent coverage. You know, we are very well, well prepared for this particular area. We don't need to worry about it. And then this will help you kind of identify where you're strong and where your gaps are. And then that's where you can start to think about, okay, now what do I do to direct my resources um, and you know my budget to addressing these gaps and filling those in? And then the next step, this kind of color coding here, is helping you identify what you absolutely have to do in-house and what you could possibly outsource to a third party you know, trusted security vendor um, and stuff like that. So our kind of goal here and our kind of you know thought leadership on this is you know based on surveys and based on the way that we interact with our customers and prospects and stuff like that it's very easy to see that it is you know nearly impossible to cover the entirety of your environment 100 percent in the house again the cybersecurity skills gap shortage uh lack of you know expertise within the cloud service provider environments or within the security tools that you might be investing in. And so really it takes a bit of thought to kind of go through, look at those, you know, gaps in your coverage and recognize, okay, what are things that are absolutely a must to do in-house, right? Unique type of threats, unique kind of environmental things, maybe something deals with intellectual property within your organization or their in-house apps that you've created yourself. Those are maybe things that you have to keep in-house and you just adjust accordingly. But then when you think about, you know, AWS, Azure, 
plenty of other organizations are going through the same sort of things as you are, right? They are deployed on the same sort of environments. There are oftentimes common levels of threats, universal things that are true about those environments, right? Understanding them is a common sort of thing. So tasks like that, you know, 24 seven kind of log monitoring, being able to identify a threat and mitigate it when it's a common thing, those might be things that you could think about outsourcing to a trusted third party uh, security company because they are universal things that every other organization does. And so it could benefit you from partnering with somebody who has gone through all of those things before, who has seen all of those common threats and has already built a security operations platform to not only identify those quickly and easily, but has the resources and knowledge, expertise, and more importantly, the experience of doing it repeatedly, uh, the ability to kind of remediate and react to those threats um, immediately. And so that's kind of where you could get into these sort of questions uh, within your own organization using these kind of frameworks to help identify where you can offload certain things that doesn't necessarily need to take up all of your time and allows you to focus on, again, the more internal things or other sort of internal business projects that might be important to you and your organization. So where does Red Canary fit in all this? Um, obviously, we've been alluding to it pretty much this whole time, is that we can be that trusted security partner. So we're not just, you know, the endpoints of, hey, we're doing the threat detection and response where we're looking at the logs and that's it and helping you remediate them. But the sort of life cycle of a threat detection and response team starts way at the beginning, right? We have a team of people on our threat intel team and threat research team that is constantly looking out for new information, new kind of adversarial tactics, any sort of new research. And they're kind of analyzing that and putting that all together. And then they're working very closely with our detection engineering team to help them build out all of these, you know, custom detections and detectors that get put into our security operations platform and then inform the way that the rest of our team helps you monitor those logs and helps you identify things and helps you hunt for not only proactively for new threats, but if something were happening in your environment, helps you identify exactly where the origin points are, what is happening, and helps you remediate and stop that uh, before it gets to the breach point, which is kind of the end goal of all security, right, is to kind of prevent those big breaches from happening in any way possible. So we've built out that extensive team with multiple different groups, all focus on the same sort of mission and helping to keep you secure. Now, what that looks like within the cloud environment, again, these challenges shouldn't be anything new. It's a lot of what we've been talking about, right? Not enough staff and resources, which leads to a lack of cloud expertise, which leads to difficulty in operationalizing the security tools you may or may not have invested in. And then depending on where your organization is at, that either means your cloud projects stall, maybe you're trying to move into the cloud, trying to migrate to AWS or Azure and get off of some of your on-premises um, kind of systems, uh, but because you're you know, afraid of not having the ability to properly secure the cloud, um, maybe it ends up stalling that entire project. Or if you're already in the cloud, again, we've seen time and time again, people feel like they lack visibility over cloud risk and cloud threats. Um, and then the right side, again, just kind of uh, the quick summary of everything I went through on that last slide, right? We have the team of experts with all of the experience necessary to help secure that environment. And then just kind of a brief high level architecture here, just kind of what that looks like from a high level view. So what we're doing is we are integrating directly with those cloud uh, service providers, AWS, GCP, and Azure. We're tying not only into their native alert system, but we are also ingesting all of the raw log activity data. Um, we ingest all of that. We perform our own sort of behavioral analysis, again, through our teams with all of our detections that we've created and through their experience, they're able to help kind of sift through remove a lot of those false positives, help you cover 24 seven and identify real threats and react to them. We're also going to be tar uh, tying into those third party tools. So again, we've already paired with Lacework, we've integrated with their CSPM uh, platform. We're gonna be doing the same thing with Wiz and that'll help just kind of inform us and you know help us kind of correlate that information, but also confidently assess like, hey, if we're seeing adversarial behavior, but we're not sure, 
and then Wiz says, hey, there's you know some sort of issue or misconfiguration thing that shouldn't be there, that could just help us confirm the type of threats and the type of activity we're seeing. And then of course, we can't forget the data plane. We have a our own Linux EDR tool, but we could you know, integrate with any other EDR tool that you might be um, installing onto your data planes like CrowdStrike, Sentinel One, if Microsoft has one, all, all that stuff, um, and collect all that raw log data too to kind of do the same sort of you know, threat monitoring uh, within your data plane. So just a high level recap, again, we're kind of providing that holistic security operations platform. And our goal is to not, you know, replace parts of your team or anything like that. We're here to augment whatever your security team looks like um, in its current form. Um, and again, going back to that sort of NIST framework, our goal is to work with you and just help you fill in those gaps and provide ways to, you know, kind of take some of the more common mundane, you know, tasks that other companies might already be doing um, off of your plate to allow you to focus on the more internal things uh, that your organization would be uh, responsible for. And before we finish up, I want to leave kind of this uh, lingering quote from Lacework. Uh, so some of our friends over at Lacework, when they wrote their blog on Androx Ghost, which actually uh, was kind of one of the things that helped us develop um, a entire detector within our security operation platform uh, for the kind of unique um, Androx Ghost uh, identity threats within the cloud. Um, and in conclusion with their blog, a great blog, highly recommend uh, going and reading through it. It's very technical and goes through kind of how they identified it and some of the things that they built out. Uh, but they sort of end with this kind of idea that, especially within cloud and with compromised credentials across the board, it's very difficult to be able to just rely on a single tool to identify those accurately, uh, especially with compromised credentials, you know, any sort of identity type of theft. It's very hard because there isn't, you know, a specific artifact or a hash like you know ransomware type threats or malware type threats that you could easily point at and say okay this is replicable this is the same sort of hash this is that type of threat when it's identity theft it's more about the behavior um, and the threat intelligence behind it uh, that helps you identify it so in this case they're referencing like hey you need a bunch of threat intel here and behavioral analytics behind this to make sense of identifying and separating androx ghosts from normal user activity that just might be slightly out of the norm. But oftentimes, if you're relying on third party threat feeds and stuff like that, the threat intel is oftentimes not always accurate or timely. So, you know, well before we ever part partnered with them, they're almost kind of alluding to the fact that, you know, relying on a company like Right Canary that is constantly building their threat intel and constantly monitoring and updating their detectors and everything like that can help you kind of shorten that gap and help you kind of mitigate and identify these type of threats. So I hope you guys learned a lot. I saw a bunch of questions coming up, so we will be getting to those in a short second. Uh, what's next for you guys? Again, you know, obviously check out our website, plenty of information there. Um, if you actually want to get deep into some of the threat kind of timeline stuff and see an actual demo of our cloud capabilities, go ahead and request a demo with that link. Um, and then as Scott alluded to at the beginning, uh, we have a lot of great resources. That AWS visibility guide is definitely one that I highly recommend reading above any of those others. Um, again, each of these cloud environments is very complicated and there are a lot of different things that you need to be aware of and pay attention to. I think it does a good job of laying out the foundation of all of those kind of roles and policies and setting configurations uh, within AWS that you have to be aware of and kind of gives you tips on how to control for those to avoid those you know, accidental misconfigurations. Um, and then obviously stay tuned because our plan um, as a company is to eventually basically release one of those for Azure. Um, tentative, I know uh, our team is going through kind of the research process and just making sure that is, you know, 100% accurate and they will get that written up in the next couple of months. And then we'll also do one for GCP uh, after it uh, becomes generally available. Um, yeah, so that is it. And I'm going to pass it back off to Scott, who will help me kind of field a lot of these questions. All right. Yeah. Super presentation, uh, Kevin. Really appreciate it. Um, one thing I do want to do is I'm going to pop up a poll here just uh, for everybody. Just, you know, what, what can Red Canary help your organization with right now? And uh, and there's a there's a selection of items there. So just go ahead and, and uh, 
you know, tick off whatever whatever you need for Bread Canary. Uh, we'll leave that poll up uh, here for a couple of minutes during the Q&A. Um, and Kevin, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about before we even get into the the audience questions is, you know, you put up that that really interesting stat about, you know, basically, well, the inverse of the stat is 70 percent of organizations don't have the capacity to maintain a 24 seven sock. Mm -hmm. You know, is is Red Canary focused mostly on helping organizations that, that don't have those resources to support that that full time sock or do you have a mix of, of, you know, customers where you're sort of providing virtual sock for for them, but also, you know, supporting the the 30 percent maybe who, who are, you know, spinning up their own socks? Yeah. Yeah, that that is actually like a really good question. Thank you. Um, no, that that sets us up perfectly. So yeah, I think a lot of people's kind of ideas of an MDR, um, especially over the past couple of years, is like, oh, they are just a replacement for a SOC team, meaning like, oh, they're only for smaller commercial businesses or you know mid-size companies that are coming in. Maybe they're cloud first only and they just haven't had the time to build out their own security team. So it's kind of like a replacement thing. Um, as I maybe alluded to at the end, we kind of fit in wherever you need. So we have customers in the commercial market that are like very, very small that are strictly using us as a full, you know, 24 seven sock um, entirely. But we also have customers all the way to the enterprise space of, you know, 20,000, you know, employees under them they have their own full built out sock because they're you know these multi-billion dollar companies uh with enough budget and resources to build out you know a 30 40 plus man team that are already doing a sock but they still partner with us because it's to them there are again some of those sort of mundane tasks that they could alleviate to us there's the sort of idea of like a second pair of eyes or an extra security expert that they could reach out that's actually cheaper than trying to hire another 20, 30, 40 people um, onto their team and doubling the size of their sock that they already have. So for them, it's like, hey, we've identified these particular gaps within our security environments, or maybe there's you know sets of things that they're like, hey, these are things that I would rather my team not do, but I need somebody to do them. Again, a lot of that log monitoring, right? Nobody wants to just be sitting in front of a computer um, and looking at all of the logs from you know, 10, 20, 30 different tools and stuff like that. So if they could offload even bits and pieces of that to somebody else um, that is more than willing to help with that and help them kind of mitigate those, we fit in wherever you need. So again, no matter what your organization size looks like, what your security team looks like, whether you're looking for that you know, full outsource SOC, or you're looking for somebody to just help mitigate some of the security gaps that you kind of identify, we're there to kind of fit in and then grow with you. So as you expand your team, we could adjust where we need, but we help you kind of provide, again, the sort of holistic um, approach and we just kind of fit in. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, thanks. And, and I imagine, you know, with, with the, the new multi-cloud approach too, um, that's going to help with organizations that, you know, maybe they've spun up, you know, they've been primarily an AWS organization, but they're adding in a lot of Azure services. You guys can help out with the with the Azure monitoring until they sort of staff up on that side as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there was a great question. Let me find it here um, from Vinod, who's, who's asking, can you provide examples of how you've helped organizations address uh, specific security challenges unique to multi-cloud deployments? Um, I think it's kind of hard to pinpoint exact examples. Um, I, I think the polling has been, been up enough. I'll, I'll kind of flip to oh, yeah. uh, some of these extra slides here real quick. I just want to make sure they're on here. So in, in general, um, what I'd say is what, what we're kind of doing in the cloud is you know um, an approach of looking at all of the different type of threats and activity that leads to the breach to help you prevent the breach from ever occurring. I'm sorry, I'm going to go back through one thing. So our focus is all of that sort of pre-threat activity and active threat activity to help you avoid the boom, right? I've heard a lot of people start referencing like, hey, we focus on left of boom to prevent the breach. So what that kind of looks like within, again, multi-cloud environments, it's 
I think it's going to be really hard to identify like, hey, there's one threat that actually spans between Azure connecting to AWS, connecting to GCP. A lot of times they're just kind of individualistic. It just means that people who are deployed on more than one environment just have more complications because it's just like two completely different environments that you know, have very, very different terminologies that might actually interact very differently um, within their own kind of ecosystems that it's hard to kind of pay attention to those things. So things that Ray Canary are kind of looking for are, again, those sort of initial access attempts, whether it's malicious, right, through social engineering, through uh, credential theft, through um, cloud token theft is a very, very common one, helping you kind of identify when a credential is compromised or if somebody is exploiting one of those kind of misconfiguration, mismanagement um, type of things. And then we're tracking that sort of activity to really help kind of hone in to confirm, hey, this is a possible compromised credential. This is an adversary within your environment by looking at all of the behavioral um, activity that is occurring within your environment to help pinpoint, hey, this is an adversary doing malicious things and they're trying to get to your sensitive data. So this is not a completely holistic view of everything that could possibly happen. This is just kind of a set of examples. But things that we're looking out for are people performing kind of the recon and discovery of your environment, right? They are looking, you know, running searches on your resources, running searches across your accounts. What accounts are available? What account permission does their account have uh, or other accounts? Maybe they are starting to generate and create new accounts to do some sort of you know, defense evasion to set up persistent access and then use those other accounts to start doing other activity so that it goes under the radar uh, from you know, a compromised credentialed account. Um, again, privilege escalation, if they find that their account doesn't have enough permissions, again, that might look like them trying to escalate their own or create new accounts with the right permissions. Any sort of lateral movement, if, they're, if you are connected to certain other systems, Again, that might be more on the data plane where maybe they're in one virtual machine, they're trying to move to another one or escape to the host itself and out to the control plane. And then if they're trying to locate the sensitive data and establish those external connections by making modifications to your configuration to what IP addresses and what IP ranges or users have access to this S3 bucket and stuff like that. Um, and then again, it's all in service of preventing the final breach, which when you really boil it down to this, it almost sounds way too simple, is that most cloud threats is in one or two categories. It's all about stealing your data and making money off of that data or utilizing your own resources um, to make their own money, right? So it's either encrypting or exfiltrating your data and holding a ransom and exploiting you or uh, the resource jacking, crypto mining thing, where all of a sudden they have access to your control plane, they spin up a whole bunch of virtual machines and other resources to do crypto mining, or maybe they're using that to do other attacks, right? Other sort of DDoS-based attacks or other type of brute force um, type things. So those are the kind of things that we're looking for. And Scott, I'm actually gonna jump in and add, answer one other question from Vinod, because I think it kind of ties into this. Um, I think he asked a couple of times sure. about um, CSPM solutions and stuff like that. So um, just to be kind of clear, Red Canary is not a CSPM. We are not directly looking at the misconfigurations ourselves. Um, that's kind of why we're partnering with companies like Lacework and Wiz who do the sort of CSPM stuff very, very well. Um, right now, I don't think there's really any plans for us to try to build that out because we would be well behind the eight ball uh, from plenty of other companies that do that way better than us. I mean, you have, again, I mentioned SASEs. It wasn't necessarily included in this presentation, but SASEs also do, you know, CSPM level stuff where they are using the API to kind of look at your configuration um, at rest in order to have surface all of those things. What Ray Canary is doing is just looking strictly at the behavioral activity. And those two things are, in essence, separated, uh, but there are a bit of overlap. And so what I mean by that is, when we integrate with a tool like Wiz or Lacework, um, even if we are not doing the same sort of things as them, their information can pair with ours to help you really hone in on what is occurring within your environment. So an example for that, let's say Wiz identifies that your S3 bucket is exposed. 
or they identify some sort of zombie account with admin credentials that are still active um, that you never kind of um, attended to. All, all they're really doing is looking at that final state to tell you, hey, something is a vulnerability. This is a risk to your environment. It doesn't necessarily tell you when that S3 bucket might have been exposed or how long it's really been exposed for, depending on when those scans hit, because it's you know daily, maybe a couple times a day at most. What you could then do is look at Red Canary's information, and we could tell you, hey, there is no threat activity occurring within that S3 bucket. We haven't seen anything suspicious. We haven't seen anybody go in and start downloading loads of data or extracting data or connecting to an API. So that could help your company kind of understand, okay, maybe this was a complete accident. There's no malicious activity occurring here. And then you could do kind of your own investigation to identify why is this S3 bucket exposed publicly or to all of these other resources um, or IP addresses? Is that needed? Is the data in that S3 bucket connected to some other system or some other application somewhere that is mission critical to your organization? So maybe you shouldn't just auto shut that down uh, but you should figure out why it's exposed in certain ways and then based on what you find attune and adjust those policies and stuff like that or vice versa maybe we did find threat activity in it and then you can confirm okay yes this was an adversary making a bunch of changes to our s3 buckets or to our policies um so when i say for us as like a you know cloud entire company and i mentioned misconfigurations it's because or the CSPM stuff is because we pair with companies like Lacework and Wiz, and we can take in their data and help you kind of identify that. Um, conversely, again, you know there might be malicious activity that goes completely unnoticed by Wiz looking at misconfigurations and changes, because again, based on timing and everything like that. So we are able to identify those threats in ideally real time or as close to real time as possible and help you mitigate that um, and lower those mean time to uh, respond and prevent those eventual breaches, um, ideally. So, yeah. Okay, excellent. Uh, thanks to thanks, Vinod, for those questions. Um, next one here from Aiden, who's wondering how does the platform address the challenge of securing data and applications while ensuring seamless scalability and flexibility within multi-cloud architectures? Yeah. So. I almost kind of want to say that that question is kind of thinking about sassy tools um, and stuff like that. So um, again, when I worked at a previous CASB, which eventually evolved into a sassy, I was kind of at the tail end of our own company stepping into the secure service edge type of stuff. Uh, this type of question came up a lot within cloud environments and SaaS environments where you're doing a lot of API scanning and maybe changing policies automated uh, automatically, right? Maybe you're uh, restricting access to certain pieces of data. Maybe you're removing data because it's sensitive and shouldn't be in a public, you know, folder or public bucket or, or whatever you might say. Or you're doing a lot of the sort of inline reverse, you know, inline proxy type of controls, restricting people from doing certain things. Um, what Red Canary is doing, we're not, we're not like injecting ourselves in the middle of your cloud environment and the way that your um, you know, employees or the way that your organization interacts with those environments at all, right? We're, we're almost like off to the side, just kind of looking at what you guys are doing and then helping you identify and say, hey, that activity is actually malicious activity and it's not a normal user thing to do. Let's go and investigate that together and then help you respond and remediate that. So we're just kind of off to the side, looking at your log data and helping you, you know, track all of that activity um, and kind of doing that behavioral analytics. So it's not necessarily like we're stepping in between your user connecting to that environment or anything like that. Um, we're just kind of off to the side and kind of helping to keep you secure. So what that means is like, we're not preventing you from scaling or, you know, your normal day-to-day -day workflows or growing into your cloud environments. We're just there to help kind of make sure everything is kosher. <laughs> okay. Um, another question here from, uh, this one comes from Paul and he's wondering, does Red Canary use adversarial techniques to help train its models to better detect anomalies or threat intrusion? Yes. Uh, yes, definitely. So, I mean, that is uh, kind of, 
what our threat intel, our threat research and detection engineering team do together is they are constantly looking at adversarial techniques and using that to train our models. So what our detection engineers do on a kind of day-to-day -day basis, um, and it's actually a talk that is might be ongoing right now in our Red Canary live sessions, um, is they are taking all of the information that they've gathered from threat intel and research, um, all of those kind of adversarial tactics, developing a detector. Uh, so for us, a detector is just an analytic that will fire off inside of our security operations platform. So we have our own sort of detection engine that when it looks through the logs, it helps kind of filter out a lot of the noise and helps kind of identify things based on these detectors that gets escalated to an actual human who will then do a deep dive investigation. But whenever anything gets triggered, whenever anything happens, we take all of that newly kind of gained information and feed it back to our detection engineers who will constantly tune their models um, and tune all of their detectors that they've created to make sure that we are, you know, making sure that it is identifying the correct things and, you know, passing off all of the fake um, kind of activity. Um, so we are always using adversarial techniques, whether it's stuff that we've learned through research um, and intelligence gathering well ahead of time, or after the fact, when we've seen something actually pop inside of a customer's environment somewhere down the line, we'll use that to constantly tune to make sure that we're always getting better and better. And that kind of goes back to the whole like herd immunity idea where whatever we see in one customer's environment just means that that's going to be better for every other customer under our wing. Um, and that what we see over here will benefit you because we learn from everything that goes on and that just improves our entire detection engine that kind of benefits everybody down the line. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Great question. Super. Thank you. Super. Um, and, uh, so probably last question here, uh, you know, we've got four great resources, but you mentioned one of them um, you, that you recommended above all the other ones. Uh, just could you repeat which one that was? Oh yeah, uh, the AWS visibility guide. Um, again, just because, you know, cloud environments are confusing as is. Um, and so it, it just does a good job of laying out in very kind of simple terms, every single type of kind of baseline role, account, service, uh, category type stuff that you need to pay attention to, and then kind of gives you tips on how to configure those properly and secure them so that you're not leaving yourself vulnerable. Because um, one of the stats I didn't really use is that, you know, a large chunk of most of the big high profile breaches over the past five years are oftentimes due to these accidental misconfigurations. Social engineering and all that stuff still takes the cake the misconfiguration comes in very closely behind because people are moving into these cloud environments without having that experience and expertise to know exactly every bit of what they do. And they just keep getting more and more advanced and more complicated. So it's hard to know. So um, those type of visibility guys just help you kind of get a baseline foundational knowledge for what you need to know that won't hurt you down the line. Like the whole idea is to help prevent those kind of accidental gunshots uh, internally. All right. Yeah. So uh, if you haven't grabbed that guide yet and you're interested in it, uh, I recommended grabbing it now because we've got probably about a minute left on the event and then the whole handout section will disappear. So grab grab that guide and, <laughs> and the other ones down. Um, Kevin, uh, you've been really generous with your uh, with your time and your insights today. Great Q&A session. Great, great presentation. Really appreciate you coming on with us today. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much, Scott. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, yeah, I will. If if we leave this up for a couple minutes, I might try to grab some of these other questions and just kind of type them real quick. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Kevin. All right. And before we wrap up, we do have one more piece of business, and that is the Amazon gift card prize drawing. And the winner of the $250 Amazon gift card is Dennis Thibodeau from Tennessee. So congratulations to Dennis. We'll be in touch to get you your card. And with that, on behalf of the actual tech media team, I want to thank Red Canary for making this event possible. And thanks as always for attending and for all of your great questions today. Uh, we are going to leave the event sort of open uh, just to, to give uh, Kevin a, a, a couple of minutes to, to you know, punch out some answers on questions here. 
But that's going to conclude the uh, the event itself. Have a fantastic rest of your day.